The views and opinions expressed in this video are those of the speakers and panelists, and do not necessarily reflect the position of the Ethos Institute for Public Christianity and its founding institutions and organizations. My topic today is a digital turn for missions in the post-pandemic era. The 21st century straddles both geographic worlds as well as virtual worlds. The continents are straddled across both. Our communities are straddled across both. Our, com our congregations are straddled across both. Our children are straddled across both. Now, for many years, I've already been talking about virtual worlds as habitats, as workplaces, as playgrounds, places where we are socialized or where we are, where we socialize, where we are socialized, and where life skills are honed, where meaning of life and identities are derived, where our deeper subconscious values and habits and dispositions are grooved and shaped. Among other theorists that have helped me include Ray Oldenburg and his concept of the first, second, and the third place. The first place is the place that you live in, the second place is the place that you work at, and then the third place is the place that we spend social or recreational time. Well, guess what? The literature recognizes not just physical, first, second, and third places, but increasingly virtual third places. There is now significant literature about virtual third places since the first time I started talking about this back in 2007. That was a long time ago. ago. But beyond virtual third places, which is where the literature is really camped at, it is not too far-fetched to talk about virtual second and even virtual first places as part of everyday experiences for more and more of urban life. Now, this integration of physical and virtual places and realities has become an irrevocable reality of modern urban life. Now, the chapter that I'm writing about for the eventual publication focuses very much, and this is my focus, on user experience. And uh, we have you know, visits to the virtual world, however we define it, and I'll try to give some flesh to that later on. Now, visits to the virtual world uh, involve very, very different individual personalities, it will involve uh, very, very different goals, very, very different experiences at very, very different types of virtual locales. Now, given the fact that the, play, the terms virtual places and virtual experiences are so varied, it would be helpful to draw from several fields of study to provide us with the language to understand the nature of these different types of experiences. From an initial six, I have now drawn, I've chosen to draw from four disciplines to inform our understanding of virtual worlds and user experiences over there. Now, these include urban sociology, and I've kind of really touched a little bit uh, on this with the place, uh, you know, first, second, third place. And then there's a virtual reality road mapping. Then there's human computer interaction design. And then there is psychology. Now, drawing from multiple disciplines can help us with more layered understandings of user experiences in virtual spaces. Each offers, each of these disciplines will offer a unique perspective on virtual digital worlds and how those worlds interface with the physical world. This in turn leaves us better informed and provides us handles and heuristics to shape the church's missional and pastoral care, pastoral care responses in and to virtual spaces. Now for this presentation, because of time, 
That's a great enemy today. I will only focus on the second. I will elaborate in the paper, but you know, for just for the presentation, uh, just on the second. So allow me to introduce you to a document uh, which has helped to shape my thinking about this hybridized geographic virtual analog digital world. So back in 2006, a very diverse group of industry leaders, technologists, analysts, policy makers, academics and creatives gathered at this invitation, by invitation only, Metaverse Roadmap Summit at SRI International Menlo Park in California. Now the outcome of this gathering was the development and the publication of the Metaverse Roadmap, Road Pathways to the 3D Web. Now, unlike the current popular hyped up understanding of Metaverse as 3D online immersive, this landmark 2007 document defined the term broadly and more inclusively. Now, by doing so, it affirmed a broad and wide continuum of user experiences in both physical as well as virtual spaces. And hence, the authors write, the metaverse is the convergence of virtual, number one, virtually enhanced physical reality, and number two, physically persistent virtual space. It is the fusion of both while allowing users to experience it as either. There is no single unified entity called the metaverse. Rather, there are multiple mutually reinforcing ways in which vitalization, virtualization and 3D web tools um, and objects are being embedded everywhere in our environment and becoming persistent features of our lives. Now, the centerpiece of the 2007 roadmap is a diagram capturing the different metaverse scenarios along two axes and four quadrants. Now, this can be found in page five of the document if you've already scanned it. Let me take a few moments first to introduce the terms which are found at the two ends uh, found at the ends of the two axes before we explain for us the four scenarios. Now, the terms come in pairs and they include augmentation and simulation, top and bottom, and then external and intimate, left and right. So we draw a bottom, uh, a, a line from left to right as they do, and above it is physical reality, and below it is virtual reality. Along the vertical y-axis, we find augmentation and simulation technologies at the two ends. Augmentation technologies add a new virtual or new virtual layers of information and, and uh, capabilities to the virtual to the physical world as users interact in and with it. Now all these technologies extend our abilities. They significantly augment life in the physical world with new possibilities. Now, because technology also allows our eyes and ears and minds to be in virtual constructed simulated worlds, we find another set of technologies which the Metaverse Roadmap 2007 document calls simulation technologies. Now, these technologies allow simulated objects and environments to be constructed within which in, uh, users inhabit, explore, and interact as simulated characters. You could be a can of Pepsi inside <laughs> if you choose to be a uh, furry. Now, note that sim uh, simulation technologies are not just for entertainment and gaming and living in fantasy worlds. We have constructed worlds where education combat training, engineering, interior design, the practice of medicine, palliative care, etc. are all into it in a big way. We are in there already in a big way. Now, along the horizontal x-axis, we find 
external and intimate technologies at the two ends. External technologies focus on the world, furnishing users with information tools and abilities with which to explore and exert control either in physical or simulated worlds. Intimate technologies, on the other hand, focus on participants, uh, furnishing users with the ability to express themselves and fashion their identities either in physical or simulated worlds. Now, this framework uh, of A, technologies of augmented physical reality and technology, and B, technologies uh, uh, to construct simulated worlds together with technology C, technologies to explore and control external worlds, and D, technologies which allow self-expression and identity construction and sharing of everyday life activities. This framework of augmentation, simulation, external, internal, allow the architects of the Metaverse Roadmap 2007 to classify user experience within what they call the four Metaverse quadrants. Live logging, augmented reality, mirror worlds, and virtual worlds. So, let me quickly explain each. Live logging scenarios would be those involving technologies that augment the identity of individuals and objects within, that, within the real world, the, the physical world, sorry. Now, what are some familiar examples of live logging? I think Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, Snapchat, coffee and bagels, depending how long you want to stay there, etc. <laughs> Especially when you use it with a focus on your daily life, your food, pictures, your travels to exotic places, your campaign to be president, you know, all that is done uh, using uh, live logging tools. If you have a channel, uh, which helps you to prove um, which, which uh, you have a channel and then in that channel you're providing great tips and tricks on on these platforms uh, you have a, a blog that offers great perspective on a range of social societal issues then you will have or you will command a following and you will be what we call an influenza especially if you know this is very important especially if you know SEO Search engine optimization, if you, especially if you know smart marketing, uh, those people who are in the industry, you get it straight away. You know the difference that it will make if you apply some of these tools and tricks. Okay? So another example of live logging would be in the use of fitness trackers. So you average 4,000 or 14,000 steps every day for the last six months. You slept an average of 6.2 hours and your average calorie intake was 2,000 calories uh, per day. Right? And just in case you're not aware of it, fitness tracking is part of that larger trend of biohacking which uses data and diagnostics to help you to optimize your mental and your physical health and in some instances, in some imaginations, to extend your life and maybe to live forever. Now, instead of wearing, uh, using what we call wearable uh, technology, so those of you who have Apple Watches or Fitbits or you know, the national fitness campaign, tracker and all on your hand. Those are what we call wearables. Instead of wearables, some who are really into it, into optimizing their lives, have opted for implants to help the body function at peak performance. Now, others embrace these technologies because of the conveniences and the productivity that they offer for living everyday life. So this one is an implant into the body and it allows you to find out where north is, right? And orientate you and, you know, they're all other practical functions. You could go ring, 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 ring and say, hello, because your phone is embedded into your hand. I've seen videos that way. 
So just a little comment about live logging and intimate technologies. You reveal so much about yourself, your habits, your desires, and your identity within that quadrant. Actually, wearables and implants are not just, uh, I feel they're not just intimate technology, I feel that they kind of straddle both. Depending on the technology that you have and the usage, biohacking actually, uh, biohacking tech actually straddles both live logging into augmented reality, reality scenarios. And that's where I want to move on to talk about that. See, so secondly, augmented reality scenarios will be where those in physical worlds are augmented with layers of information and tools for users to this time explore the world. Intimate, you know, it, it's more about yourself and your identity, but now we are exploring the world. In your travels overseas, you could use a map and a, camp, a compass uh, like we used in the old days. But why do that when you have Google Maps and Waze and Naver Maps going to Korea? Uh, when you travel, you know, you, when you explore your travel destinations, I mean, not only will it tell you how to get from point A to point B, it will also tell you where all the good food and shopping places are complete with reviews, ratings, and recommendations. Now, related to Google Maps would be Google Earth, which allows us to explore different parts of the world from a drone's point of view. Now, whenever I take trips to Israel, oh, I think I pressed the wrong one. Did I press the wrong one? No. Oh, how is it this is so fast? Yeah, okay. Whenever I take trips to Israel, uh, I often use uh, Google Earth, okay, and uh, I will give my, you know, the, my participants a, a sneak peek of the sites that we will be visiting. So what you see here is the Dome of the Rock in the old city in Jerusalem. Or if you are a Pokemon fan, instead of catching in your screens, which is what we used to do in the old days, you can go, and I mean you can Pokemon go, uh, to different physical locations to catch them because AR, augmented reality, creates an additional virtual interactive layer uh, over the physical world. That's the augmentation of physical life to explore the world. I think another example of augmented, uh, uh, virtual and augmented powers in physical worlds would be chat GPT. Now, this is my personal uh, best dialogue partner these days. I call it my personal valet. And I've got it to help me with so many questions about Bible and history and philosophy. And uh, because I sit on the board of the Methodist School of Music, we are going into community music, you know, even practical practical things like providing me a list of community music activities for seniors or for special needs, depending on who, you know, you ask it, give it a good prompt, it'll give you a good answer, complete with BPSS benefits and a series of lesson plans. What's so BPSS? Bio, psycho, social, spiritual. If you're in that field, you totally understand what I'm talking about and why it is necessary for assessment. Now, there are, oh, these are just a few of the external technologies that augment our lives and our experiences in the physical world. Let me explain virtual world scenario before mirror world scenarios. Now, I think most of us, you know, would naturally think of 3D interactive, immersive environments which you access using, and I, I want to emphasize this, headsets and controllers. And hence, if you look at this picture, you will see headsets and controllers. That's a very, very critical part of the experience or uh, to maximize the experience. But you can also, you know, I mean, that's when we are talking about VR and metaverse, you know, when we conjure those words, that's what comes to our minds today. Now, you can also use motion sensors, you can use haptic suits, touch sensor, you know, and uh, treadmills, etc. you know, besides just the headset and the hand controllers. You enter those constructed 
or simulated worlds as avatars, either with a first person or a third person perspective, and there you interact with other avatars. Now, that is one definition of virtual worlds. I say one, okay, one, because the NV, uh, MV roadmap defines this quadrant inclusively so that virtual world scenarios are not limited to 3D immersive interactive environments. Now, at Singapore Bible College where I teach, we use several 2D virtual world scenario platforms. One of them is Gather Town, where users gather as 8-bit, you can see that, you know, users gather as 8-bit characters in 2D offices, conference rooms, and social spaces. And so it is 2D interactive and immersive. Okay. There's no need for you to wear a VR headset, no need for you to use a VR uh, controllers. Uh, you just use your mouse as a controller and, and you'll be fine. Okay. Uh, incidentally, this is not in my script, but you know, there's this, uh, com this conversation we we're talking about asymmetric interactions. Asymmetric meaning some people are wearing headsets you know, and they're going in as a 3D experience, but you can also participate in the same experience, but as a 2D participant, uh, hence asymmetric. There's a whole literature on that, uh, but that's just uh, extra, comes at no extra charge. Okay, so, um, but unlike Zoom, okay, let me just compare Gather with Zoom. Unlike Zoom, Gather allows you to move from room to room and only those in the private spaces, if you go into a private space room, they can hear your conversations, but if you can see the others moving around, but they're not in your private space, they won't be able to hear your private conversations, okay? Now, I want to show you a short video of my students uh, introducing Paul's first missionary journey, and they did this as a project for me in my class, and this is uh, in the youth Bible study using Gather, Gather Town. You may not be able to hear the sound, but they are talking. Okay, and the leader is leading the people, uh, and I kind of blanked out their faces because, you know, obviously they are kids and they're minors, okay? So, uh, basically, he's talking through, and he's just coaching, I mean, one person, one or two guys are coaching the people through uh, Paul's missionary journey. They obviously customize this to, for the purpose, uh, because the regular Gather Town has got its own templates which you can customize. Now, we also use Miro board. Miro is a feature-rich, infinite whiteboard with templates and tools for brainstorming, for content analysis, for planning, for problem solving. I've used it in a whole range of contexts. Here we have uh, an example of students in my diaspora missiology class, and you can see them, they're in class and they're using Miro board, uh, working on a task that I assigned them. And this is just this year, they were brainstorming pull and push factors which contribute to a global phenomenon called global householding where our households are now made up not just of our own people, but people from overseas or different countries. And we were talking about global de-householding when these people are filling our gaps. The gaps that they are leaving back home are disrupting their own families. Uh, so this is a topic that we were exploring. Uh, so what we have here is wherever you are, because this is online, wherever you are, uh, you can find that you can co-create, you can collaborate on a work task together. Now this is another example of 2D virtual experience. Now coming back to the more common understanding of virtual reality as 3D interactive immersive space, some of my students invited artists from three mission organizations to explore 3D art making. Sorry, this is not a very good picture because I took a snapshot and it didn't come out well uh, from a video. Uh, three mission organizations got together to explore 3D art making as mental wellness, outreach and support for their own missionaries. So I find that very, very interesting that even within the mission organizations, we are actually working hard on mental wellness support uh, for their own people and for outside. 
as a, as a means of outreach. Now, a few of us who are involved in this ministry, we use this platform called Spatial IO. Uh, that is, uh, those are my spatial spaces. Uh, this is a interact. Uh, this is a 3D. You have to put on your headsets in order to get in for the the full experience. But you can do it 2D also. Um, and this is my home. It looks nicer than my real home. And uh, this is me visiting a student. He did a student project. He posted in a gallery. He put his photography inside. And that's me. You see the backside of me. In the real sp spatial world, you can see me dancing, etc. Uh, because there are certain, you know, you just press certain buttons, it does all the work for you. Um, OK. But so some of us use spatial as a platform. So we're talking about a particular specific platform. Others I know who are in this ministry, they are using other platforms such as Roblox or Minecraft to do discipleship and to do outreach. The, these things are happening. There's a very big gathering in Singapore that are doing that. The final scenario that I want to, to feature uh, and explain is what they call mirror worlds. Now, unlike virtual worlds, these are constructions of imaginary worlds, uh, sorry, Unlike virtual worlds, which are constructions of imaginary worlds, mirror worlds are actually scenarios which create realistic, real-time, virtual representations of mirrors of the real world. Now, this concept is actually less familiar to most of us, but it is very commonplace in engineering, in construction, in transportation, in healthcare, to have what is called a digital twin to have a digital twin which uh, is built. Now, in the case of skyscrapers, we have sensors and we have other sources of information which are gathered from the actual building, and they help us to keep the digital, and they help to keep the digital twin updated. Now, the digital twin is able to help teams to respond to immediate issues such as leaky pipes and predict outcomes requiring interventions such as material wear and tear, run simulations of extreme and complex scenarios such as bombing and evacuation drills. Singapore Bible College, no sorry, Singapore has the honour of being the world's first country which has a complete digital twin, enabling government agencies to handle asset management, urban planning, disaster responses, etc. The Singapore Indigitous team, if you know that term, they have the honour, equally the honour, of building the, the digital twin for Lausanne 4 in South Korea. They're building it as we speak. <laughs> they normally work on Saturdays. <laughs> so I want to come back to the earlier quote that I shared with us, which is that the metaverse is the convergence of, number one, virtually enhanced physical reality and physically persistent virtual spaces. It is a, it is a future of both, while allowing users to experience it as either. There is no single unified entity called the metaverse. Rather, there are multiple mutually reinforcing ways in which virtualization and 3D web tools and objects are being embedded everywhere in the environment and becoming persistent features of our lives. The reason why I took time to explain this roadmap and some of the key ideas in this document is because I want us to appreciate that it affirms different expressions and degrees of virtual and digital in its definition of metaverse. Ministry using tools and platforms in the different quadrants will be different. And so will be the issues and the challenges which are encountered. So, now, some of the virtual in, in some of the virtual platforms, some of the people who work and play and hang out in these four metaverse scenarios will represent mission fields. On the other hand, some of the virtual platforms and the believers who work, play, and hang out there will be our missional means and they will be our missional agents. Believers who are experts and influencers in those quadrants can help us to demystify 
virtual worlds and open our eyes to missional and pastoral possibilities as well as problems. But coupled with this broad understanding of metaverse is the need to introduce to us a broad framework of missions. Now, those of you who are familiar with the term integral missions, we kind of introduced it today, you will be familiar with the integral mission framework, which was championed by people like Chris Wright in, this is only one of the books, uh, this is actually is a local edition of what he wrote, Andrew Walls and other leading uh, top world missiologists, including in the integral mission framework would be proclamation of the good news, teaching and nurture, compassion ministries to the vulnerable in society, social justice and uh, and. Uh, creation care. Furthermore, the Lausanne movement has identified, oh sorry, so uh, in Chris Wright's uh, reckoning, um, a, you know, it kind of serves the church, it serves society, and it serves creation. Furthermore, the Lausanne movement has identified 36 missional issues and today there are networks of committed believers which are collaborating to address the big global local missional issues of society today. Okay, I, too fast, I have to move it really quickly. Now, because of time, I will end with two questions about engaging digital virtual spaces. And my question is very simple. Is Jesus Lord and Master in geographic and virtual spaces? Now, if the answer is yes, then we have before us arenas and spheres for Christian witness and Christian influence. But the second question I want to raise is this, but are non-Christian groups also interested to exert their influence in that space? Now, it seems clear to me that the missional and the partial mandate, I mean, it's, it's clear that the missional and the partial mandate is, is there. Right? Each quadrant, we find, is feature-rich and it is context-rich. Each quadrant represents unique opportunity and challenges, requiring different missional, different pastoral, and different theological responses. My question for all, my challenge for us is, where are you already? And what is your calling? What is the church's calling, a missional calling, to the digital world? And do we need to think more creatively about where we are already and what we are already doing? And uh, maybe we need to explore some of the issues in, in what we are doing more deeply. Or do we need to stretch ourselves a bit more and learn more about new missional frontiers in order for us to explore missional, pastoral, theological, and ethical responses. Thank you.